archaeological scientist and an archaeological theorist. I did my PhD very heavily on archaeological theory, and I finished my PhD 10 years ago thinking that theory was exactly where I wanted to be and where it helped me answer the research questions that I had. Um, and then I had to get a job and a postdoc, and the reality of that was that all the jobs were in archaeological sciences. So I grudgingly went off and worked with isotopes, I was a theorist. Um, and so, so what I'm trying to say is that in my own research, I tend to bridge the gap between wanting to do theory well and wanting to do it comprehensively and, and to think about some of the questions that theory teaches us to attend to in archaeology, but using scientific methodologies and using scientific techniques. And there are contradictions and tensions in that, which have proved to be very productive in my own research. And what I want to contribute to today's session in over 10 slides, I've given myself 10 slides to do this, um, is to talk about an outreach activity that I've been doing, which is causing me to reflect, firstly, on the way in which I do outreach, the way in which um, this particular activity is developed over time, but also on the relationship between science and theory and how we present archaeology to the public. So, um, to start with a quick introduction to the um, outreach that we've been doing, it's basically Neolithic cheese making. So we started back in 2015 with Sophie Charlton um, for an event in York where I think we were just really curious to see how Neolithic sieves that Melanie Selk at the University of Bristol had showed were used for cheese making worked and I met someone who could make me some, so he made me some, and we thought this is a great activity, we can go and talk about some of the research we've been doing around the Neolithic diet, talk about cheese making um, and take it out to people. So it was basically show and tell at the beginning. We took it to a few more things, so out to the Festival of Archaeology, and again, very much more show and tell, talking about the methodologies and talking to people about cheese making. And as we began to do that, the conversations that we were having with people were getting more complex and more involved. People were responding very strongly to what we were doing. I think we spoke to over a thousand people at the Festival of Archaeology in 2016. And since then, it's evolved in various different ways into a much more engaged activity. So um, ultimately, um, over the last year, I've been working with the volunteers in the Stonehenge Visitors Centre on a whole series of different experiments around um, processing milk and how we engage the public in getting involved with thinking about the history of cheese making and the history of dairy products in their diet. And across the course of that time, I think there are some patterns in people's responses to what we've been doing and to their responses in, when they get involved with the cheese making. And the first one is that it's um, very emotional for people. Talking about your diet and talking about the role that certain foods play in your diet are emotional. They bring back memories. It reaches back to your childhood. It's relational to the relationships that you have with people. And this idea that, but that's how my grandma used to make it, comes up all the time. But this idea that there's some kind of heritage that they're responding to um, as we begin to talk about it. Um, and I think that's not very surprising because food, of course, is deeply embedded within our own identities. Um, and, and of course, as we begin to explore things that have roles in our own personal history and shaping our own sort of personal identities um, in relationship to other people, it brings out that um, emotional response. And it cast me back to an anthropology I read a few years ago by someone called Catherine Stewart. And she was working with rural, poor populations in, south, um, in the south of the United States. And she said that, that she spent a lot of time with people negotiating social practices, um, what was right, what was good, what was moral. Um, and she said that that's what people wanted to do. They wanted to talk about their identity and talk about how it was situated. They put time and effort into figuring things out. And I think um, that figuring things out, that negotiating where you stand on things, is what people were trying to do. So particularly this relates to dairy foods, but I think there are other foods that we could talk about as well. That on the one hand, it's very much naturalised as part of the diet. So it's part of the eat well plate that the government put out. It's something that comes, it's associated with childhood, with mothering, with nurturing and caring. Um, and uh, so in some ways it's kind of, normative. It's part of a naturalised part of the diet which stretches back um, to infancy um, and all things good and healthy. But on the other hand, um, there's also a separate dialogue about um, it being othered. So uh, 
challenging the fat content of it. So is it really as healthy as it is? And this growing dialogue around the dairy industry and, and whether that's, if that's a big business and whether it's safe. And I think what the danger is that as we began to talk to people was that archaeology was contributing to this naturalised. They saw, came to us to talk to about cheese and saw it as very much, oh, this is the origins of cheese. This is this natural, healthy, good thing going on. Um, but there's this other side, the present and the future, which is very politicised. And this matters because, of course, foods and dairy products are politicised. Um, and this is drawing on the anthropology of Andrea Wiley, um, who has uh, studied the, the case of the dairy industry through an anthropological perspective in the state. Um, and she was talking about um, this tension that's inherent within dairy products um, that comes bound to, in the states, often a very racialized or um, ethnic divide around lactase persistence and how it's been handled since that has been um, noti noticed. So really, we only began to understand some of the breakdown of lactase persistence in the 60s and 70s, and that raised itself very much within the legal system in the, the states in the 90s, in which the PCRN, um, which I think is the Physicians Council for um, Regulated Medicine, took a case um, to try and stop people, um, to, to, to try and sort of get law a lawsuit against the National Dairy Council. And the Na National Dairy Council then challenged this by saying you're racially stereotyping um, people by saying everyone is lactase persistent. So it brought into this sort of um, dialogue that there's a great big tension going around about what foods you can eat and how they relate to your identity. And the sort of politicisation of that since has sort of developed from, um, I think, very much um, this particular dialogue around what people are capable of and what's natural. And the reason that I think this has developed is because milk as a westernised food is therefore held up as being something that's natural to do. The assumption on the basis was that people in the West were the normal and anything else was divergent. And what was happening was around food is, I think, a dialogue between natural and other, and this duality that developed around it. So what we have on the one hand is um, I, I'm figuring out my own identity, but on the other, you're beginning to construct a sort of opposition between, um, on the one hand, doing things that fit in with everybody else, and on the other hand, trying to cope with the politics of identity around that. And I think while archaeology can't challenge overall, um, it's never going to end racism on its own, we can begin to contribute and to unpick some of those particular narratives. Anthropology um, can do this very well, I think, by looking at some of the modern practices. Um, but what we can do in archaeology, um, firstly, is by uh, looking into the processing um, of, of dairy products and telling that story, which again, as Izzy um, and Andrew said, shows that we don't have a simple to complex narrative, that things are complex from the beginning. And we can also, as archaeologists, tell a global story and challenge some of those more dominant Western narratives. So I'm running, I'm running out of time, so I'll run through this quite quickly. Um, so just to sort of point out that the origins of daring in the European ethic doesn't just come from the sciences. We don't just look at the sciences. There's all sorts of different ways in which we can begin to bring together different types of evidence from context, material culture, as well as drawing on some of those, those other um, more scientific techniques. When it comes to the technology of cheese making, however, when you start to actually start the process with people, when we begin to talk about it in an engaged way, the dialogue that we have with people doesn't start with, tell me everything about cheese making. It starts to break it down to different questions, which allows us to kind of hermeneutically spiral between how we know particular things um, and, and how that, that might have fitted into people's food cultures in the past. It begins to people to appreciate that this is part of their own identity um, as much as it would have been part of people's identity in the past. So as they, I think as we engage through practice rather than demonstrating, if people got involved with the cheese making, um, they could begin to understand how the knowledge that archaeology had was constructed. We could began, begin to tease apart how different methodologies were contributing to different different knowledges and reflect on the relationship between past and present results, um, past and present um, knowledges. 
Um, and I think what we were doing in sharing these techniques and engaging people was developing an embodied knowledge. So beginning to kind of unpick some of the taken for granted values around food and to challenge some of the norm normative ideals that perhaps were presented from a more modern narrative by taking apart the deep history. Um, and that led me to reflect very much on how I was approaching um, the role of dairy in, in telling the, me the Mesolithic Neolithic transition. And just because I didn't really have time to explore this, I've used processionalist and post-processionalist, but I, don't, I know it's not that neat and tidy um, in terms of being science versus theory. But the point I wanted to make was that when it comes to how they approach the Mesolithic Neolithic transition in terms of the role of food cultures within that, they're using um, the same approaches to science and theory in terms of othering and naturalising. So you other the other approach, you kind of treat it as being something different by naturalising what you're doing in the same way that as we begin to tell histories and naturalise um, the approaches to dairy. Um, so beginning to talk about practice and how those foods were valued and beginning to unpick them with people were allowing us to kind of engage with different epistemologies at the same time and to kind of um, flatten out those horizons. Um, so we didn't set out again to talk about some of these more complex ideas. We just set out to make cheese. Um, uh, but the tension that we had and those conversations we had with people arose um, because food is so deeply incalculated within who we are in terms of the identity, in terms of identity, in terms of body and health, um, and so on. Um, and therefore, dairy and cheese proved a really powerful route um, into considering uh, some of these broader issues around uh, more complex ideas about how we integrate different approaches to archaeological ideas. Um, and I think it really has, for me and for the people around, had transformative effects um, on, in our own approaches to food um, and how people are sort of uh, engaging with debates around authenticity in food. Um, and so rather than sort of passively listening to the narrative, they were actively engaged in creating that narrative for themselves. So, and then thank you very much to everybody who's helped out. Sorry for going.